Hello, and thank you for tuning in. This is an audio-only broadcast, part of the series on humanists and hoplites. These lectures are my attempt to offer a detailed and comprehensive academic argument about the proper place of firearms in American society. And I'd like to repeat now a statement I made in the prefatory lecture. This mission of mine is not a happy one. I would prefer to spend what little free time I have rediscovering Chinese philosophy and continuing to explore intellectual history. I am writing these lectures, if that's the right word for them, because I am deeply troubled both by the inability of anti-gun liberals to see the anti-humanist hypocrisy of their position and by the often disingenuous rhetoric of the right and of the gun crowd at large. I hope these broadcasts reach the intended audience, and I hope they make a difference. In this broadcast, I want to attempt to outline a very basic permissivist, or if you like, pro-gun argument. What I offer here is really only a very basic framework of one kind of permissivist theory in favor of minimal restrictions on civilian access to firearms. This is not a distillation of my theory, nor even a summary of where I stand on the issue. It invites more questions than it answers. But I offer it now as food for thought and a starting place for what will follow. Okay, here we go. My thesis question now, the question for which I want to sketch a brief answer, is do the possible risks of harm due to a wide civilian distribution of handguns outweigh the possible benefits of wide civilian distribution of handguns. I aim to approach this with as much brevity and analytical rigor as possible, and rather than give you an answer, I want to suggest how you can answer the question for yourself. The relevant variables will be the same for civilians as they would be for law enforcement and security personnel, but let's put them to one side for now and focus only on civilians, on those who do not need, quote-unquote, to carry firearms as part of their job. To answer this question for yourself, first, determine on the basis of your demographic the likelihood that you will be the intended victim of an assault or of an unlawful invasion of property that very likely could result in your being assaulted. And what I mean is, based on your age, gender, race, based on where you live, what you do for a living, and what hours you keep, and based on what types of environments in which you find yourself on a regular basis, try to figure out as objectively as possible your personal risk factor. You can get at least some of this information by looking at Department of Justice data, by consulting things such as the Uniform Crime Reports. Now, DOJ and law enforcement agency data should cover some things, things like age, race, gender, the city or town in which you live, but use your own best judgment for some of the subjective variables. For example, do you work a night shift or a diurnal 9 to 5? and the place of your residence apart, do you frequent known high-crime or high-risk areas, and so on. And in doing this, try sincerely to eliminate so far as possible your subjective ideas about risk, and let the data from the DOJ and law enforcement agencies give you the statistics, or give you at least enough statistics to have a more than subjective only picture of your personal risk factor. Now, here's the second step. Find data about injuries and death, data about harm that results to owner-operators of firearms due to negligence or non-negligent accident or misadventure. And by misadventure, include whatever figures you can find for incidents where an owner-operator's firearm was used against him or her by a perpetrator. Do not for now include accidental injury or death to the children of owner-operators. This is another topic altogether. Third, and for our current purposes, lastly, access data about the number of times lawful use of a firearm has prevented or has seemed reasonably to have prevented wrongful harm befalling the owner-operator of that firearm. Now, in theory, you should have all of the data you need to determine whether all things being equal, your own ownership and operation of a defensive purpose firearm will be more likely to cause you harm 
or to help you avoid suffering wrongful harm. You can even assume, if you like, a wide distribution of firearms on the part of other lawful owner operators, and if you like, hypothesize that if they are as responsible and sane as you think yourself to be, that their ownership of defensive purpose firearms either increases risk of harm to you, decreases risk of harm to you, or has no bearing whatever on your own exposure to risk. Now this might seem like a lot of academic legalist posturing, but it isn't. For both permissivists, that is, those broadly in favor of limited restrictions on civilian access to firearms, and for restrictivists, those who describe themselves mainly in terms of supporting greater restriction on civilian access to firearms, both camps often offer consequentialist arguments in efforts to capture the high ground in this debate, at least when the defining characteristics of the high ground is that it is reasonable and rational. Consequentialist arguments are, obviously, arguments about consequences, specifically the consequences either of too much access to firearms, too wide a distribution of them, or too much interference with access to them and too limited distribution of them. There's been some talk lately of addressing the gun control issue as a public health problem. After all, healthcare economists and epidemiologists are used to working with the data that quantifies risk, injury, and loss, and I think we should welcome their input, bearing in mind the following. We simply do not have as much of the kind of data as we would like to have for sound cost-benefit analyses simply because many facts are underdetermined, meaning we don't have enough of the right kinds of numbers for this kind of numbers game. Second, even where we do have some of the numbers, numbers alone will not give us all of the answers. Cost-benefit analyses result in consequentialist arguments, ones that articulate the right policy or course of action based on consequences, that is, based on the effects of causes, or if you like, on the outcomes of events. The problem is, A, there is rarely enough data to support some claims about some consequences, B, Claims about cause and effect relationships themselves cannot be determined by numbers alone, and c. Consequentialist arguments tend by their very nature to give short shrift both to values and to principles, and that means both permissivists and restrictivists find it difficult to make evidence-based factual claims about risks and harms of access by civilians to firearms. There may be data that speaks to the likelihood that your assault would be by an assailant with a weapon, but where is the data that can predict whether the assailant will be more like a human being, someone you can talk out of harming you or perhaps even frighten off, or more like a predatory animal? And where's the data that can suggest with accuracy that any given attempted aggravated assault will not escalate to attempted homicide? And how can any set of numbers, any data about demographics, predict whether you will or you will not one day be the victim of an assault? The numbers game has its appeal for sure, but it cannot settle the issue for us. Quantifiable data and good statistical models should be able to give at least some insight as to whether, on balance, in the event of an aggravated assault or an unlawful invasion of property, having a defensive firearm will be a bane or a blessing for the operator. I personally would like to see more and better data for this. But the rationalist paradigm, the one being pushed hard now by restrictivists, has more problems than even its most intelligent and intellectually honest proponents realize. Check out John Ralston Saul's book, Voltaire's Bastards, The Dictatorship of Reason in the West. And drop me a line if, after reading it, you too see the relevance of Saul's observations about the tyranny of well-intentioned systems management approaches to human problems. I end this broadcast now with a simple question. Do you or do you not believe that, as a responsible, rational adult, you should be allowed to decide whether, all things considered, you want a firearm for personal defense? Or do you want that decision made by those who, having no better command of the limited facts available than you do, simply don't like guns? 
If you're rational enough to follow this very simple analysis, and you know that you are the sort of person who would keep firearms and ammunition safely away from children and unauthorized users, if you know that you have the intellectual and emotional maturity to decide whether defensive firearms are right for you, well, don't you want that option? Don't you want to do the research and the relevant math and the soul-searching for yourself? This, I admit, is precisely where I find myself most troubled, most dumbstruck and tongue-tied when discussing the issue with my academic colleagues and progressivist friends. And I promise I don't mean progressivist now in a pejorative sense. They claim the rationalist high ground on issues such as women's reproductive liberty, whether free speech extends to flag burning, why a municipality should make recycling mandatory, and why our public schools should take a zero-tolerance attitude towards hate speech. And on many points, and for the same reasons, I agree with them. But what rational, reasonable person would pressure lawmakers to remove an option? And how can the very same people who seemingly so treasure liberty of choice demand of their legislators that they eliminate the liberty to choose to be armed? And I confess it amuses me also to think that those who seem to value freedom of expression and diversity and equality before the law and opportunity for the weakest and most disenfranchised members of our nation would yet vote to disarm themselves on the basis of incomplete statistics and sentimental math. But it makes me desperately sad to think that perhaps they value liberty and these other valuable things so little that they would be unprepared to fight for them. I mean, really fight for them if necessary. Firearms, at the end of the day, are tools. They are means to ends. And if the end is self-preservation, the protection of self from wrongful harm, and if that end is part of the foundation of our bundle of core human rights, then how could any responsible human being not wish to have for him or herself at least the option to attempt, if necessary, to be the definitive guarantor of that right? None of this is about the right to shoot, injure, or kill another human being. It is about the liberty to make the best ends means adequation one can, the one that is appropriate to you. And this includes the liberty to avail oneself of an option at some later point in time. Look, living in a secure luxury condo in an upscale part of the city, perhaps with two small children in the house, maybe at this time the risk of harm seems reasonably to outweigh any possible advantage or benefit of firearms possession or ownership. Living in a more secluded area, farther from the reach of first responders, maybe no small children at home, perhaps being confined to a wheelchair oneself or suffering mobility issues, maybe having at home and in one's care a loved one who is less mobile and, to that extent, more vulnerable. Things like this could change some of the variables. So surely would not a rational, reasonable individual want at least to have the option to recalculate and reassess his or her priorities, and then the liberty to choose a firearm as a rational means to the end of self-defense? If there is a natural human right to self-defense, to the defense of self from wrongful harm, then really the question is, should rational and law-abiding adult citizens have the option to decide for themselves whether, to the best of their knowledge and in light of their values, a firearm is or is not an appropriate tool serving the means to the ends of effective defense from wrongful harm? And that was difficult to say, and to put it any simpler, it might have risked oversimplifying it. But here's a point that I can state simply. All consequentialist arguments, pro-gun and anti-gun, are based on incomplete data. They are all underdetermined. If not cost-benefit analysis, if not consequentialism, then what? That is the challenge, and that is the subject of the next lecture in the series. If you've listened all the way through to the end, thank you. Wherever you are, be safe and be well. Goodbye for now.